Well, Ambassador Vetter, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks so much for having me, Rebecca. You've had a very busy year. You spent much of the past year on an airplane. Uh, you were the lead negotiator for the agriculture uh, section of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You're also in a very unique position because you were born and raised on a farm in Nebraska, so you have a unique perspective on, on agriculture. Let's start out with the TPP. It seems that, uh, that the success of the negotiations on agriculture are kind of a hidden story in TPP that not enough people understand from what you're telling me. Well, I think that's right. I think TPP really provides an opportunity for U.S. agriculture to access some very high income, high value markets, but also to get a foothold into those markets that Mr. Pratt was discussing this morning, that emerging economies in Southeast Asia through Vietnam and Malaysia. And so we can continue to send and grow our market share into economies that already buy our highest value products, our beef and pork into Japan. Um, but in Vietnam and Malaysia, right now, they buy our feed grains, skim milk powder, basic commodities. But as their population grows and more of that population enters the middle class, we see huge opportunity to send them more protein, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we see this as a win in those markets on volume, value, and variety terms. Let's talk about Japan. They've been famously protective, particularly with rice. Um, and you were saying that your, your job is really so difficult because you know, every country has a sensitive sector. And in Japan, it was rice. But you got them to blink a bit on this. Uh, that's right. Um, well, I think it's important for people to remember that the second part of agriculture is culture. And when you look around the world, uh, the most protected markets, the highest tariffs, the most difficult barriers are often in that agriculture sector. And if you look at both Canada and Japan, uh, who have some very closed markets, for the first time in a free trade agreement, every product without exclusion was on the table and was liberalized in some way. And so never before in a free trade agreement had Japan opened its sectors for beef, pork, wheat, rice, dairy, or sugar. All of those products are on the table in TPP with significant new access. Uh, Canada, in uh, our previous trade agreements with them, they didn't offer any access to dairy or poultry or eggs. We have new access, or would have, uh, in all three sectors if TPP entered into force. Uh, I would say that the prospects for TPP are not seen as very optimistic. What happens after all this, all this work if, uh, if it isn't passed? Well, I'm an eternal optimist, and there is, in fact, a narrow window to be able to approve TPP in the lame duck session. And agriculture is really critical uh, in that fight. Um, I think there are a few sectors of the economy where participants understand that they are the face of trade and they are traders. I mean, I grew up in farm country listening to the price reports uh, you know, every morning on if pork belly futures were up or down and what the price of wheat and corn was. But in that same report every morning, US farmers and ranchers hear about whether there's a drought in Brazil or too much rain in Russia, and they firmly understand that they are competing in a global commodity market. And so I think there's a real opportunity to continue to build the support and momentum, and there is time to get this done in the lame duck, and that's our goal.